Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Peter O'Shaughnessy. I'm new to Ember London, so thanks for welcoming me. Um, I'm not going to talk about Ember because I don't actually know anything about Ember, except what I learned tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk just generally about the future of the web and the future of web development and ask you all, what do you think is going to change in the next five years? What will the web and web development be like in 2020? I am a developer in a small team called Future Technologies in a big company called Pearson. Um, so we spend quite a lot of our time thinking about all these technology trends and what might be coming next. But before we look at the future, I want to go back five years so we can see how much has changed during that time. So this was the state of the art with mobile five years ago. Uh, we didn't have the iPhone 4. We didn't have iOS because it was still iPhone OS back then. Um, we were still on Android 2.1 Eclair. This was the state of the art with tablets back then. The iPad didn't come out till this month, five years ago. Sorry, next month, five years ago, April 2010. Um, this was a, a lovely one called Motion Computing J3400. Smartwatches we had back in 2010. Who knew? Uh, this is a nice one from Samsung. I think they've come on a little bit of a way since then. And this was browsers five years ago. We didn't have IE9 back <coughs> then. Um, does any, everyone remember the excitement that you had when IE9 arrived? No. <laughs> 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 and uh, this, is this, this is some of the JavaScript frameworks five years ago. Well, hopefully some of you recognize the logo on the left. Um, I don't know this. I had to Google this on Wikipedia. Um, apparently, Ember was Sprout Core back then. And uh, we didn't have Backbone yet. That was, I think, October 2010, the first release. And no React, of course. That's far too new. So a lot of things have changed over the last five years. So I think we can expect a lot to have changed by 2020. But in fact, we should really expect a whole lot more to change in the next five years, because the pace of change is increasing. Um, I guess we all know about Moore's law saying that the computing power doubles every couple of years. And um, it's pretty amazing when you think about this. So obviously, this is a, a logarithmic scale on the left. So you can think that this is exponential. This is uh, over 100 years from 1900 to 2000. And if you zoom out over 200 years and you look up to 2100, then you can start plotting on uh, the equivalent calculations per second for brains of us biological creatures, like our human brain is up here. And if you look at whereabouts roughly we should be in 2020, we should be somewhere roughly between a mouse and a human brain for $1,000. So I'm looking forward to having a nice cyber dog pet in the year 2020. And this is extrapolated out by a lot of futurists, like the famous Ray Kurzweil, into not only just being about technology and calculations per second and the speed of computers, but human progress in general. And Kurzweil believes that a whole 20th century's worth of progress happened just in the first 14 years of this century, and that a whole other century, 20th century's worth of progress will happen between 2014 and 2021. So you can imagine what the next five years are going to be like if we have the best part of a 20th century's worth of stuff happening in terms of progress. And before we go into the web and web development, I just want to give a bit of context about what else might be happening in the world in 2010, 2020. So we should have the first robot Olympics that Japan are planning to host alongside the, the other Olympics for us puny humans. Uh, Japan are also planning to have a moon base built by 2020, built by robots for robots. <laughs> <laughs> moon politics is going to be hotting up because Russia also want to be launching industrial mining on the moon of helium-3 by 2020. Seven companies, including Google, plan to launch driverless cars by 2020. The Large Hadron Collider is due a massive upgrade in 2020, which could unveil the true nature of time and the possible existence of other universes. But the best thing about 2020 
is we should have a full service on London <laughs> Crossrail. <laughs> so now let's look at the web in 2020. Well, predicting is obviously easy. All of us can make predictions. Getting something right is pretty hard. Um, I'm sure we all know some of the predictions that have famously gone wrong. Steve Ballmer on the iPhone, etc. Um, I'm going to keep things fairly general. And the other thing that I've done is I crowdsourced um, other web developers to get their opinions, get their ideas. Um, because one of the things that's shown about uh, making predictions from research around it is that if you ask lots of experts and you do things like averaging their opinions and things like that, it can help you to make better predictions. Um, I haven't been that scientific. I just put it out on Twitter. <laughs> Got a few Twitter responses. But um, I have asked a few experts, and we're going to show some of their responses as we go through in the slides. And what I would also like to do at the end is just to throw it open to all of you here in the room and get some of your ideas too. So I've just broken the web down into these four topics. I'm going to start with mobile because uh, mobile, obviously, by 2020 should be even more old news for most of us by then. But it's worth remembering that uh, even now in 2015, um, still only less than a third of the world have smartphones and only about two thirds of the world have a mobile phone at all. So it's pretty cool that by 2020, 90% of the world over the age of six should own a mobile phone. And smartphones should account for two out of every three of those connections, it's predicted. So we really are starting to get to a stage where um, we can be truly global. And hopefully the web will have really caught up on those key native app features that we've all come to know and love. Um, like rich offline experiences, um, being able to do background syncing, having push notifications that work like they do with native apps so the web app doesn't even need to be open. It can just pop up when it's ready. Um, these are some service workers, by the way. Um, so service workers is, is really exciting for hopefully um, having that resolved in the next, hopefully, couple of years. And I think we're going to see that trend continuing with web and native blurring, the lines between them blurring. Um, this is Android Lollipop, which uh, most of you may well know by now, um, has done a pretty cool thing for web apps. Because in the recent view, where you get to scroll through your apps that you've got open, um, it shows web applications now as their own frame, um, their first class citizens in the operating system. Um, they're not just hidden within Chrome, the web browser. And uh, also pretty new, I think, is the web application manifest spec, um, which I think you can already use now in Chrome on Android, um, which gives you a nice way of defining um, things like your uh, title and your logo to add it to your home screen. So what I'm hoping we'll get to by 2020 is the best of the web, having something that is instantly accessible, universally accessible, and also the best of native. Now, this is hot off the press today. I just managed to squeeze this in at the last minute. Um, this is a GIF showing the new app install banners that is coming with Chrome 42, um, which is the beta channel right now. Um, and hopefully, if we run through it at least once, so you can see um, this gives you the chance to have these little banners that pop up at the bottom asking if you want to add it to your home screen. Um, so it's a very native-like experience um, for your web apps. Next, graphics. So we heard a bit earlier about Glimmer, um, which I think sounds really cool, how it's taking inspiration from things like React and um, potentially going a step further by the sounds of it. And so hopefully, in the next couple of years, um, we're going to get to the stage where we have fast user interfaces by default. So at the moment, it's a pain. Um, if we want to have user interfaces that feel really slick and smooth, like the native companions, um, we tend to have to do a lot of work to optimize. We have to be very careful, and we can just easily do something that slows it down. Hopefully, we'll get to the stage where everything's 
really fast unless we do something really stupid and mess it up and then it goes slow. I think hopefully we'll see WebGL no longer just being for demos, which it still seems to be pretty much at the moment, even though it's now, of course, on iOS. Um, and I think one thing to remember is that WebGL is not just for 3D content, but we can also use it for 2D content <coughs> and t making um, 2D graphics really fast, um, something that libraries like Pixidjs do. I think Unity could become a big platform for the web. Now that Unity 5 has a WebGL exporter, um, I think it's just come out of beta in the last week or two. Um, Unity is obviously a, a really popular platform for game development. Um, I think we'll start to see some really cool games coming through on the web from that. And I think it will be interesting to see what people use with Unity um, as well as just games, hopefully other kinds of rich interactive media as well. And WebGL isn't just standing still. Um, WebGL 2 was recently previewed, and that's in the works. Uh, Kronos Group, who are the standards body behind WebGL, are also working on Vulkan, which is the successor to OpenGL, um, which is set to try and compete better with the Metal API that Apple have been uh, working on. And so we should be getting even better, faster 3D graphics that we can run on mobile devices and have some amazing experiences. But it's worth remembering that we don't have to go crazy with WYSI 3D content all the time. Um, simple user interfaces are obviously most often the best for user experience. And um, we've actually seen design trends like flat design and material design tending towards nice, clean, simple interfaces. Um, they do have uh, some WYSI effects in terms of um, kind of pseudo 3D effects and things like that, but they are quite subtle and it, it keeps it quite simple. And I think the complexity really will go behind the user interface. We'll have more and more complex systems going on in the background. Then the network. So by 2020, we should have 5G rolled out. So if you're fortunate enough to be in an area of coverage, uh, it could be pretty cool because you can hope to expect something perhaps even greater than one gigabit per second. But we shouldn't let this make us complacent about the bandwidth, especially because we've been seeing the trend that websites are still getting slower. Because we're throwing so much more down the pipe, we're throwing big images and videos. Um, this is the top e-commerce sites, um, I think from 2012 to 2014, and you can see the page load times of those has been going up a lot. I think we'll also have a further rise of video and streaming. This is one of my crowdsourced contributions here. Talk and video will become ubiquitous as texting is now. Um, and interestingly, since he sent that, we had uh, the whole Meerkat app explosion in the last couple of weeks. Have we all seen Meerkat, the app? Uh, the talk of Silicon Valley. So this is all going to give rise to a data explosion. This is a graph showing <coughs> 2014 to 2019 mobile data traffic. And you can get a sense of how much we're expecting that to explode. So we need some things to help. Hopefully, HTTP2 will help. Uh, this is an unofficial logo. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and this is already in the works. I think it's already in Chrome, but behind a flag. Is that right? And uh, Google have said that they're planning to remove support for Speedy in early 2016. So they're um, obviously hoping that the HTTP2 will be ready um, enough by then and have taken off well enough, be better down enough that they can switch that off and we can be moved over to HTTP2. Um, and it's pretty interesting to think about how this is going to affect web development um, because it's going to change a lot of the best practices around optimization and um, things like just bundling up all our uh, JavaScript resources into a single file, all of those kinds of things, the best practices will start to change. And so it may, take, may actually turn web development on its head. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> another trend we may see is a rise of peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, this is another submission from Twitter. 
Uh, what I see is that encrypted streaming forms of sound and video messaging will become standards and directly peer-to-peer. -peer. And I think we will see WebRTC having a big role to play in this. Um, WebRTC, I haven't been hearing that much about recently, but it seems to be quietly growing. Um, and I think uh, Google Hangouts now uses WebRTC. So I think we're going to be seeing some interesting innovation around that. A couple of people mentioned about HTTPS, because HTTPS will no longer be optional for things like service workers. We're going to have to use that. Um, and so hopefully we'll see that HTTPS, having SSL for our sites, is going to be free and easy. Hi. Okay, great. So I need to read up about that. So maybe HTTP2 will help with that too. Uh, next, interfaces. I'm not going to talk much about smartwatches because it's in the news and everywhere at the moment there's a lot of news and commentary on it. Um, I think I would just say that um, they might be kind of cool for a while and I think Apple will probably make some really good margins on this because they uh, are selling them, some of them for so much. Um, I don't think they will be the next smartphones because uh, we already have smartphones and it's not, I don't think, going to actually replace that for us. Um, I think it's interesting to start thinking about how these things are going to um, connect and combine and augment with each other. And I do think the whole wearable space is interesting for um, fitness and quantified self and those kind of uh, themes. Anyway, um, Brett Victor had a great rant a while back about pictures under glass and how um, all of these uh, ways that we interact with digital content now are essentially just pictures under glass, things that we prod with our finger or swipe around. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see um, how much of a trend in the next five years we have of things coming out from behind the screen and uh, having other kinds of ways of interacting, um, ways that are more natural for us, using our hands in natural ways, for example. And one of those could be virtual reality. Um, one of the responses there, sudden rush of VR devices released onto the market. Um, of course, we have things like the Oculus Rift that are coming fairly soon. Um, I have tried a few of them. And uh, I think the, they have a lot of power in that first experience, that first time you put them on. And you have that wow factor of um, suddenly having that feeling of presence that you've been transported to another place. My worry is just that uh, that um, novelty may wear off, especially when um, you have the issues around nausea um, and people not being really able to use these things for long periods. I know the Samsung Gear VR instructions say um, that you should have a 15-minute break every 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> and so I think they've certainly got quite a long way to go. But do I think that in five years' time this could be a big deal? I think, yeah, probably it could. And also, I'm especially interested in virtual reality and augmented reality merging, which is something we're starting to hear more about now with things like the Magic Leap, um, which has been fairly closely guarded as a secret until recently, where they've just been starting to give interviews about it. Essentially, uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's like tiny projectors that um, project light into your eyes, but it does it in a clever way to merge it with the light that you're already getting from your surroundings. And um, by having a kind of a uh, spatial 3D camera, it can actually do it in such a way that it can project things as though they're in your environment with you. So that could be pretty neat. It's going to take a bit of development. Uh, holographic user interfaces, HoloLens, of course, we had the announcement about recently. Um, and I think they're actually planning to release the first version sometime this year, 2015. So um, it sounds really ambitious. I did hear from someone who had uh, spoken with someone who tried it, and they said it pretty much does live up to what they were saying, which um, kind of surprises me, because most of the videos you see for these things, um, Meta, for example, um, when you try it out, you realize, OK, 
the video really was um, kind of selling a vision. It doesn't really accurately portray how these things work right now. Um, but anyway, HoloLens should be really interesting. And by five years from now, um, I think that could be uh, something that has really taken off. Haptics as well. Um, as Brett Victor said, um, it's not that much good just to swipe your hand across some glass um, when you want to actually interact with, with different kinds of content. Um, this was a tablet that I tried last year at Mobile World Congress that actually had a simple kind of haptic effect as you ran your finger across the glass so you could kind of feel the, the bumps of the alligator there. Um, that's pretty rudimentary, but I think haptics as a trend sh should get really interesting. In fact, um, the Apple Watch, of course, has some kind of haptic effect with the uh, heartbeat transmission that it does. I think it's an interesting trend anyway. The physical and digital world blurring. Um, we're seeing an explosion of smart objects. Um, this is just the latest example that I saw, um, which is a smart rope. And uh, first of all, it counts the number of um, jumps that you're doing. And it has one of those persistent LED effects. So it actually um, displays in front of you the number of steps that you made, um, which is kind of cool. Um, but this is obviously just one of millions now of s smart objects that are starting to crop up. We're seeing so many of these kinds of things come up on Kickstarter now, um, a lot of them powered by Bluetooth low energy. And I think we'll see a whole lot more of that as well, um, which is why Google are working on their physical web project, which is about getting the web ready for this Internet of Things explosion, um, having these smart objects and having a way that you can, a standard way that you can interact with them. So say you go, they, the bus stop is an example that they have. Um, you should just be able to tap something and instantly connect with that and get uh, the bus times from it, etc. Humans and machines blurring. OK, this is getting a little bit more out there now, but I think this is potentially a, uh, we'll see some more innovation in this space in the next five years anyway. Um, things like smart clothing, these are smart tattoos. Um, and as uh, a recent Back Channel article said, step by step, we're integrating computing into ourselves. It's kind of like the next extension of wearables. But that's maybe going a little bit too far out there now. That's probably not really in 2020. So coming back down to Earth, what browsers will we have to support in 2020? Uh, well, this is a, an article from Paul Irish about what the browser lineup, be like, lineup might be like. Um, and of course, we've got a lot of Internet Explorers with their um, release cycle. Um, actually, we should cross off 8, 9, and 10 here because um, those should be s officially sunset by 2020. Um, but yeah, we're still going to have probably a lot of different versions of IE, uh, especially. And a couple of the other responses on Twitter, there'll still be millions of JavaScript frameworks, and it's all going to get more and more confusing. So how can the web keep up with all of this? How can, how can it keep pace? And how can we keep up as web developers? Well, one way or one thing that should help is the browser moving more to this low-level API model, um, having something that we can extend and we can build out our features and libraries on top of those. And then as they become standards, they get rolled into further standards. But the browser gives us a lot more uh, power and a lot more functionality by exposing things in a more low-level way. And that's essentially the extensible web manifesto. And browsers experimenting early. Mozilla and Google are already working on WebVR, um, which lets you just build uh, web applications that, in, that uh, interface with your <coughs> virtual reality headset. And we've already had this working with the Oculus Rift, which is pretty neat. And so yeah, it's great how the web browsers are already working on this, trying this out. It's pre-standardization, um, but they have these uh, separate browser builds that you can go and download and you can start trying it out and giving them feedback. Of course, we can continue to be collaborative on open source and share things with each other and that will help us all to keep pace. And we'll should have a rise of modular, modularization and reusability with this trend towards componentization. Um, and so, of course, we've got web components, Polymer, 
React components and components in other frameworks. Um, also, I tried FT's origami service today, and that worked really well. JavaScript should get better, too. This is a, a slide from jQuery Conf just a week or so ago. Um, I hadn't realized, but it sounds as though ES6 is now ES2015, and they're moving more to um, releasing features when they're done. And so, uh, as we've seen from the things that are going into these future versions of ECMAScript, um, JavaScript should get a lot better, and it should be a better um, development language for us to build things on top of. But we'll still be able to use whatever our favorite language is. Uh, so Michael said there, explosion of client-side languages, compile your favorite language to JavaScript. And Mike said, I reckon someone is going to make a web framework on Swift, and it'll be cool for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, another interesting aspect of this is Asm.js. Um, and I think that is what Unity compiles down to. Um, so perhaps we'll start seeing that um, rise as this uh, subset of JavaScript that um, is frequently compiled down to from these other languages. We might also start having more artificial intelligence style tools that will help us as developers. Uh, I don't think in by 2020 the robots will have killed us yet. Um, I think that we hopefully also won't have annoying clippy style uh, hamsters um, that uh, ask us things like this. Um, but I do think that um, there will certainly be a trend towards the tools getting more and more intelligent and uh, doing more of this uh, grunt work for us. Um, perhaps kind of off the top of my head, things like internationalization um, with computers becoming much better and better at translating between languages. Perhaps the, almost all of that can be automated in the future and you press a, a button and you have your tr site translated. Um, things like that anyway, I think we'll be re really interested to see where we get to in five years. And you never know, I Feeney said, I predict cold fusion will have a resurgence. It's, it just makes sense. Um, final thought, we can influence the future. We're, we, as web developers, have a great opportunity to contribute to these standards in these future directions and the way the web goes. Um, so it's a great place to be. And now I would like to ask you all, you're very welcome to ask a question if I can hopefully answer it as well, but I would like to throw it out to you and say, what do you think will have changed by 2020? Does anyone have any thoughts they would like to share? Anything I, you think I've gotten wrong? Or any big things you think I've missed out? One of the things you didn't say explicitly, but I kind of read through the whole thing is, you know, I think it was Ray Kurzweil actually who, who said uh, you know, he felt that technology throughout time has always been moving closer and closer to our bodies. And then you talked about you know, the VR and uh, the tactile response and a number of things where we're, we're in the next five years, we're going to be interacting with, directly with our senses. And uh, so the mo mobile was a step closer, but maybe it's going beyond mobile and it's, it's more directly interfacing with our senses. Uh, I'm the old, probably the oldest person in the room, I guess, or more of the older people, and I, the only one probably who has, hear, who has hearing aids. Um, and uh, they're high-tech hearing aids. Um, and I can uh, basically hear, I can, it's, an air, it's an airplay device, so I can basically hear whatever I like through them. And, um, and I found it surprisingly functional. And, I, and I'm surprised that you know, with the high margins of things like Beats headsets and the, the focus on audio, that we're not talking about that a little bit, and that you know why are why isn't because vi vision is an obvious thing and it's kind of sexy, but it's a lot harder to pull off than audio. I think without anyone actually targeting audio, I'm able to, being the one guy in a room of 50 people, use it without anyone building an application for it. You know, I just use Google Maps. I put my, my phone in my pocket, and and I you know this little person whispering in my ear. It's great. Yeah. It's, um, it's reminded me of a couple of things that I, I thought about but I didn't include actually. Um, so the, the whole thing about kind of augmenting ourselves with technology, um, another prediction for 2020 is that it's the first year that um, the Paralympics, the athletes in the Paralympics um, may outperform in general the, uh, the normal Olympics participants in the equivalent fields because they'll have these amazing smart prosthetics um, with the trend that we sort of have yeah, seen with Blade Runner. and. Uh, these things becoming intelligent as well, perhaps, uh, or having more technology built into them um, could potentially do amazing things. Yep. Um, and also, yeah, with our, to do with our sensors, I, th I, 
I missed out um, the whole kind of voice recognition thing, which I think will also be another trend. Um, and it is interesting to think about how the web really is only um, sense, uh, it's only really our visual sense primarily, and some audio. Um, and uh, it kind of makes you laugh, but things like um, smell <laughs> and taste. Um, I, before yesterday, actually, I was thinking, yeah, that's a little bit silly and a bit far off. But actually, I almost got convinced by a presentation I went to yesterday um, at the Wearable Tech Show, which is um, about someone talking about digitizing food and being able to send a, a cake to your grandmother over the internet and have it printed out and those kinds of things. Um, and uh, yeah, I also recently saw a, a prototype for smell vision with virtual reality that kind of gives you the smell effect when you're in VR, um, which is maybe a bit scary, and maybe that might come about. But. I think another thing is, if you can see it in um, Kickstarter, and, and it's, I don't, I don't know, maybe five years before it's actually legitimate technology, but uh, being able to scan food and being able to really understand the nutrients and, and the uh, food quality is going to completely revolutionize the whole food processing industry. I mean, it, we live in this world in which we depend on a labeling system which is very broken, and all of a sudden, when consumers can actually test for themselves, and no one's regulating how much they can see, all of a sudden there is, the, the, you know, the lights are on in the room and people can see and they can choose products. The whole industry's going to change. It'll be good for us, I think. Uh, yeah. I have a, have a more kind of wide prediction. Uh, and basically, the, the medium and small companies will essentially die out because uh, it's going to be, in the future, it's basically going to be, it's going to be like, companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, whatever, they essentially, infrastructure providers, and we have billions of indie developers and designers that, and, and because the minimum, the small, the small and medium sized companies can't compete with Google for infrastructure, and they also can't compete with like small developers, that, you know, on innovation, right? So they just essentially die out, and like, uh, like banks as well, because things like Apple Pay, you know, Google Pay, that sometimes it's don't pay, like you'll get to the point where you don't even notice how you're paying with Apple Pay or Google Pay. You, you know, like banks become sort of pointless, and they can't compete with you know Google on Apple Pay, for example, or Google Pay. So it's essentially the future is like you have the project providers who are big, they have the developers, and designers, and more people, and then they, they build MVPs and AI prototypes, which eventually get bought out by. Yeah. I know, I know what you mean. Is when you think about artificial intelligence, then you need that infrastructure. It's going to be the companies that um, get to the stage where they, they're able to build out these things that um, will have a big advantage. But I suppose on the flip side, though, that you you will hopefully get companies that kind of um, provide some of these things as a service to other developers, and um, you you'll be able to use this kind of um, AI agents or machine learning services and um, hook off the back of those. But yeah, I guess there probably will be more and more power go to those. Yeah. Hi. Mine's a little bit more web-centric. Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, I battled with the uh, new top-level domains. It's a love-hate thing. Dot coffee. Mm, don't know whether I love that. Uh, I think a lot of developers probably share the same thing. Just get the dot com and own it. Um, but consumers will make top-level domains mainstream, and you'll see businesses need various top level domains to compete and the top level domains themselves will be very single purpose whereas beforehand you would have a company website and you'd have everything underneath it you may start to see a coffee shop just having the dot coffee and it's just its location or the dot car or the dot something else so it might be that sites get smaller but more dispersed mm. that's a good, good point yeah I hadn't thought about that, that um, it also reminds me that another thing I didn't mention was IPv6 and how that can hopefully uh, help to um, pave the way for some of this I Internet of Things kind of explosion with uh, everything having its own address. Um, but yes. Yeah, so imagine like a background worker, like a service worker. Yeah. And the service workers, well, they all live on the dot worker domain, obviously. Mm. Oh, okay. Guess I need to buy the dot worker domain now. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Kayleigh. Uh, thanks for the talk, really. um, I think in 2020, the Browser, which is already our uh, development environment, will actually become a design environment much more than it is right now. I know that Google is actually working with the designers to make uh, to 
gradients, animations, uh, color picking, that kind of stuff, much more accessible to non-engineers. And so I think that we can see uh, the depth of things like uh, too many Photoshop comps and that kind of stuff. So I really hope we're going to see that new trend of designing in a browser coming to product people, designers, UX people, uh, designing interaction designers, that kind of stuff. And also, maybe we'll be able to center vertically stuff in CSS. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a bit far fetched. Yeah, no, that won't happen by 2020. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really interesting to think um, about um, how, where the expertise is going to lie and how much kind of computers are going to do more and more. And uh, mentioning design kind of reminded me about have um, you seen the grid? I think the grid IO, which is basically. Artificial, in, artificial intelligence website design, um, and it kind of uh, picks the images for you and kind of tints them for you and crops them for you, and actually does that to the extent that it arranges a whole website for you. And uh, the idea is that you know you don't need a web designer because you can just use this service and it will create the whole website for you. Um, I think that obviously one thing is that um, as you kind of commoditize. Um, some of the development work and turn that into these services that people can do easily, then by that time the, the state of the art has gone further ahead and then um, developers are doing more and more interesting and uh, cutting edge things still. So um, it's, yeah, it's definitely an interesting area with, with uh, the whole AI rise though. <coughs> oh, hi. You talked about peer-to-peer, -peer, um, IPv6, which effectively makes everything in public IP, Internet of Things, which leads to security and password management which is a problem we still haven't solved. Yeah, what is it, 20% of passwords are password? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, yeah. I think if you look at if you look <laughs> pin numbers, I think in five guesses you can get to 30% of pin numbers. Um, it's a problem that humans are bad at remembering passwords and computers are really good at guessing. Um, we're going to need to find a solution to that, otherwise all our data is public. Yeah, do you think we'll end up having the uh, Touch ID for the web, or something along those lines, perhaps. Yeah. That only works if we have a device to touch. Yeah, that's true. So if we're not next to a device, mm. you can also claim the photograph. Because they've done those politicians, like they've got yeah. a picture in their thumb, and some photograph, and they recreate their thumbprint. Yeah. But it's not. So yeah, that's, that's going to be tricky. Nature keeps inventing a better tool. That's the problem. <laughs> That reminds me also, another thing I didn't mention was permissions, app permissions. We really need to solve that with the web, don't we? I'm hoping yeah. by 2020 we'll have that we sort of solved. We've Active Directory. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, How much more time have we got? Um, let's see. Should we wrap up? Should we see if anyone else has got any? Yeah, is everyone feeling ready for the pub? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask one question, actually. Yeah. Well, I don't really have a solid prediction on this, but I'm very curious to see what tools we're using in 2020 and whether we're still using text editors from the 70s. Mm. And also, in terms of what we're doing for the server side pieces of our applications, things like Amazon's Lambda service, where it's installing a, a function into some cloud infrastructure and being run against various things it's connected to. I, I sort of don't see things like Rails and uh, .NET going away by 2020, but maybe we will have this completely, completely new model of building applications. Yeah, it's, it's, I think when we're using these IDEs, we're already having more and more um, it doing little intelligent kind of corrections or suggestions and things for us. I think we'll see more that rise more and more. Um, and so I guess that maybe the trend will be that we'll be typing out quite a lot less. Um, it will be scaffolding things, um, figuring out what to put around what we're doing, maybe more. Um, maybe we'll possibly by 2020 we might also be talking a bit more to computers because we can actually generally talk faster than we can type um, and if that gets clever enough possibly um, start giving it verbal instructions. I think that could be interesting anyway in a few years. Um, if, if, you, if you check out three lines just Basically, it's uh, sales and node machines from Rip, you know, right? So what we do, you can basically drag and drop your backend 
in this rides, sales, services, and milk machine to combine them away. And you know, if you want to try to drop something based on therapies, you want to write milk machine, which I can drop that. So you can like design scalable backend with drag drop. Cool. Yeah, just uh, I don't know how good is it. Thanks. All right, and thank you very much. Great, thank you.